I looked. There is no check the engine light lights. How many of you have had your check engine light go on before? How many of you have just put a piece of tape over it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm sure if it was really bad, something else would happen. All right, let's look at the poll results uh, from our, our, our uh, voting. <laughs> there you go. What do you think won? Fuel? I would have thought gauges. We don't need any gauges. And the winner is fuel gauge by a landslide and then temperature gauge and then those like me who are just cynical who needs a gauge who needs it at all this morning we're talking about any any guesses gauge talking about warning lights the the sign the times in your life when God tries to warn you has God ever tried to warn you and you just didn't listen Maybe you put a piece of tape over the warning light that God was giving you. I could not think of a better person to share a story, a road trip story like this, than our youth pastor. So while Jeremy's coming up, give him a round of applause. Before he tells his story, um, our lawyers required me to give you a disclaimer. This is a do as he says, not as he does moment. This is not, do not copy anything uh, that, that he did. What did I write down here? Don't try this at home. Do not do anything that Jeremy is about to share with us on your own. Jeremy, tell us your story. Where, when did it start? All right, so I'm going to follow this up with, I was 17, okay? Um, I was young. And um, I, this, is the, this is the point in my life, I would say, when I began to kind of do my own thing and walk away from my relationship with God. So let's preface it with, with that. That'll kind of give you an idea of why I made some of the decisions I made. So this didn't start... I can't wait for this story with all these disclaimers, right? <laughs> so this didn't start out as a road trip in, in, in a car. Okay, this started out as a normal trip. It, I'm 17. It's Christmas uh, break. I'm a senior in high school, and I have a friend um, who's going to fly out this couple days after Christmas to go visit his girlfriend in Arizona. And he says, Jeremy, you want to join me? It, it, it would be fun. And yeah, why not? I don't have anything to do over Christmas break. So we get in an airplane, and we fly to Arizona. We're there for probably, we're supposed to be there like four days till after the New Year. We're there two days, um, and my friend, his girlfriend's father, comes up to us and said, gentlemen... I think it's time for you to go home. I don't know why. It was the third wheel here. I was just having fun. I don't know why we got sent home, to be honest with you. Um, sure. Probably, probably, probably my friend. So, <laughs> by the way, remember that part of the story. It becomes very important here in a minute. So, of course, we get a ride to the airport. We get in an airplane, and we come home. Well... Earlier in the week, we had some conversations. Um, his girlfriend's family was going to be going to Texas for the New Year. Since we got sent home early, they decided they were going to do something different. So we come up with this plan, and our parents, our parents don't know that we got sent home. We did not tell them that we got sent home. So we fly into Denver. And of course, when you landed, you told them. No. No, we, we still thought, what's the problem? They think we're in Arizona. We have a couple days. So we get back into Denver, and we get to my aunt's apartment where we'd parked the van, and we start to have this conversation. Hey, you know what we should do? We should get in the van, and we should drive to Texas. We should drive to El Paso. This is New Year's Eve, okay? So we're thinking, they'll be in El Paso. The girls will be in El Paso. It's only like a nine-hour, just about a ten-hour drive. So we could make it, right? We could make it by by New Year's. We could ring the New Year in and have a good time, so we get in the van. And we start our journey to El Paso. We drove straight through. It, we stopped for gas. Um, and I tell you, Toby mentioned that, um, he mentioned Prince and the song 1999. It was 1999, and we were listening to Prince driving down I-25 headed to El Paso. So we get to, we get into El Paso, and um, at this point it's probably 
one o'clock in the morning. We, that's the van there. It was one of those Toyota vans. This is important to remember. So in those vans, the engine is under the console and the driver's seat of the van, okay, in these, in these Toyota vans. This van has a lot of history um, with this particular friend of mine, and that's for another time. Um, <laughs> so we get, into, um, we get into El Paso. It's after midnight. We didn't make the deadline. But we stop at a gas station, and we take the, what did you call it? A, what kind of shower did you call it? A garage a shower. gas station shower. A gas station shower. We put some deodorant on, brushed our teeth, and we drive to um, where his girlfriend and her parents are at. Now it's like 3 o'clock in the morning. So we stop. We knock on the window. His girlfriend sticks her head out the window. We're sleeping. Talk to us in the morning. Okay. No problem. So where do you think we slept? In the van. Go with the van. The van was parked outside. We didn't have any money for a hotel, so we slept in the van. Well, needless to say, New Year's Day, um, we were awoken to his girlfriend's father knocking on the window of the van. And we look out the window. Can you guess what he said? <laughs> so we open the door and we're like, yeah, what's going on? Is there a problem? He says, I thought I sent you gentlemen home. And we're like, oh, yeah, you did. Y yeah, we just decided that we would come and... We didn't know that man from everywhere. We, yeah, we, you, that's right. We were talking. David said, he sent us home from Arizona, not Texas. <laughs> so he walks us in and um, he says, I'm going to stand by the phone. Because he said, do your parents know you're here? Well, of course not. We're not, we're not going to tell them what we're doing. So he stands by the phone while we make the phone call home and have to tell mom and dad, um, hey, we're in El Paso, we got sent home. Um, fortunately, they did feed us breakfast. They were kind people. They fed us breakfast and... Way kinder than I would have been, <laughs> just for the record. They, they fed us breakfast and, and sent us on our way. So maybe the second time we, we'll get it, right? Well, we get in the van and we're driving and driving and driving. And I want to say when we came from Denver, we came Colorado, New Mexico, we have a map, right? Texas. So you'll notice the first blue line, we came from Thornton all the way down to El Paso, right? So you'd think we would end up going back through New Mexico on the way home. Wrong. We take a wrong turn, and we end up driving like 200 miles towards Arizona. We see the sign, welcome to Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> so we flip around, and we make our way back. And um, you'll see on the next slide. So, so you'll see, we're driving. You see a little town, truth or consequences? Okay. So we're driving. We get into truth or consequences. This, and we get gas. We're thinking, okay, we'll get gas. We'll head out. Well, a couple miles after we get on the interstate, um, the van, we just filled up with fuel. The van, all the gauges on the van go on and the van stalls out. So we pull over to the side of the road and we're thinking, what could be wrong? Um, well, let's check the engine, right? All the lights are on, something's gotta be wrong. We lift the driver's seat up and flames start shooting through the van. So that, that is exactly what it looked like that, that evening. Um, in what city? Truth or consequences, New Mexico. Ironic. Tell me God does not have a sense of humor. <laughs> I, ironic, right? So the van burns to the ground. I mean, the, Now, before that, you told me that your mom gave you something when you left. Oh, and yeah. gave you a very clear instruction. So when we flew out to Arizona, uh, my mother let me use her brand new luggage. And that luggage was in this van. Now, um, by the grace of God, um, when the van started on fire, we jumped in, and I knew the first thing I had to come yeah, out was the luggage. This is one of those moments where they say, if your house was on fire, what would you run in and get? What did you run in and get? <laughs> this is a do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> the luggage came first. The book of CDs that we were listening to, we grabbed our last pack of cigarettes, 
a cell phone, and $5. I, I'd, nothing that is useful to survive when your van burns down out in New Mexico. Um, and you literally watched the van burn to the ground. Yeah, I mean, when we saw, we saw pictures of it um, after the fact, and the seats were all wired, the tires were blowing out, the steering wheel was wired. I mean, it was, it was burnt to the ground. I mean, literally burnt to the ground. Okay, so, so then how did you get from there home? So we got a ride from, because at this point, our parents don't know the van burnt down. Um, we get a ride, a state trooper picks us up, and he takes us to a hotel um, where we have to call my friend's mother. Now, thankfully, this was not my van, it was his van. Um, so we, we called his mother, and um, she was very upset, to say the least. Um, not only because her van burnt down, and we, we were where we weren't supposed to be, and you know, you could, at the time we didn't see why she was angry, but you can see now. Um, <laughs> but she had to pay for our hotel. My parents did not have a credit card at this point in, in life. Um, they did, fortunately, because they had to put a hotel, they had to put bus tickets because we then had to take a bus from uh, Truth or Consequences to Albuquerque. Um, and then they had to buy my airline tickets um, so that we could actually get home. How many of you would have left them in Truth or Consequences? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Your friend's mother was way more gracious than we are. She, she was. So were there any warning signs along the way that were telling you in hindsight that you shouldn't have done this? Now, I know I asked Toby last week, would you have done it all over again? Okay. <laughs> For the longest time. Actually, up until recently, I said, well, yeah, there's nothing wrong with this story, right? It was just two 17-year-old boys out having a good time. Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, at the time, it was a good time, right? We were out doing our own thing, having fun, wild and free. Um, and up until recently, David asked me again, just recently again, would you? And instead of asking myself, would I? I took it and spun it around to the question of, is that something that if I had the opportunity again, Lord, would I? If I'm looking at it from my relationship with Jesus, would I? And asking God, would I do that? Should I do that? And then it becomes a no. Um, the first part of that trip, yes, was okay. Um, our parents knew where we were at. We were, um, there wasn't anything wrong with that part of the trip. What happened is when it turned to our own, hey, let's just do our own thing. Let's not really consider anybody else or anything else and let's do our own thing. Thinking that, what's the worst that could happen? Who's going to affect us, right? Um, so two 17-year-olds can't see the moments that they, they made wrong decisions, but you probably can. What, what were the turning points in this story? You tell me. You tell him. All right, the behavior that got them sent home. So whatever that was, and I really don't. Jeremy can't I, remember. No, whatever, I whatever was a, that moment. I was a third Are you buying that, Jen? No, she ain't buying that either. <laughs> All right. So whatever got sent them home. Okay. What next? Taking a Toyota minivan. Taking a Toyota minivan. I right, see. So saying just the original thought process. <laughs> All right. What else? There's a couple of big ones. Not staying home, right? That's kind of the pivotal moment in the whole story, isn't it? We got sent home, and instead of staying home, what did we do? <laughs> we turned around and drove to El Paso. Didn't, didn't tell anyone yeah. <laughs> where we were going. Didn't tell mom and dad. Didn't even didn't tell the girlfriends. I cannot tell you how upset I'd be if my girlfriend's boyfriend showed back up in El Paso. <laughs> he was so kind. Not to shoot you in the he, face he right was. when he saw you. He was. And yeah. so, so that's where that comes in, right? I thought, well, where, is, where, was, the, where was the sin in that? Here, here's where I look at it. Scripturally, I'm 17. I'm not an adult yet, right? I'm living under my parents' um, roof. Um, they're still in charge of me. They're still, you know, raising me. Um, scripturally, we're told to honor our mother and father, right? That's a command from God to honor your mother and father and in that case when I started to look at it from that point and apply my situation to scripture that's when it started to hit me like 
wow. You know, just on the surface, yeah, it didn't seem too bad. But then when I realized that not only was it not honoring to my own folks, it wasn't honoring to my friend's parents, and I think most importantly was his girlfriend's parents. So at first it didn't seem like there was anything in there that you would say, man, what's, what's really wrong with that story? But when you dive deeper, when you actually take it and you apply it to Scripture, what would Scripture say about that situation? All of a sudden it's revealed and you go, wow. Where God just reveals something like, no, I wouldn't do that again. Okay, so we're going to get to those spiritual lessons. Did you learn any life lessons, any personal lessons, at least looking, maybe not in the moment, but looking back on it as a husband and father maybe, anything you learned out of that so, whole situation? There's three that I kind of pulled out of this. One, and we all know this because we've all experienced it, right? Bad choices, poor choices have consequences, right? And usually they're big consequences. In this case, my poor choice, the van burnt down, and I will tell you, I was grounded for four months. It was an expensive bus ticket. How many of you think he got off easy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was, I was grounded until I paid every penny back to my friend's mom. Um, you know, and then again, it was the trust with my parents, right? We had to start to rebuild trust again. That's a pretty big consequence um, in itself. The other one was our decisions don't only affect us, right? They affect those around us. In this case, it was pretty far spread. It was um, my friend's girlfriend's parents, my parents, his parents. I mean, think about this, our decision. See, we didn't own the van, his parents did. Um, I'm pretty sure that affected them. <laughs> um, you know, it was their insurance. It was their, it was their money that they had to dole out to get us home when they didn't have to. Um, and then it comes, it basically boils down to this, right? Your sins will find you out. Here, here in a situation where we thought, we'll never get caught. We'll get to Texas, and we'll get home, and they'll say, how was your trip to Arizona? And we'll go, great. <laughs> right? That was the plan. <laughs> Arizona twice, and only once were we supposed to be there, right? How many of you have learned that lesson in life that your sins will find you out? One way or the other, right? No matter how, what God tries to do, how, what, what he puts in your path, very often we just don't listen. Now, there are some similarities between Jeremy's story and Toby's story from last week. They both had difficulties. They both had things that went wrong. If you remember last week, Toby tried to smuggle tools across the border from Canada into the U.S. and was stopped. But So there were difficulties and hardships. Uh, right, Toby had a Route 44 drink spilled in his entire car. But would you say that these stories are the same? Similar, but are they the same? No, so when we get into the spiritual lessons, we're going to talk about kind of those same sorts of things. Last week with Toby, the, kind of the spiritual lesson we took out of Toby's was, look, when trials come, when hardships come in your life, as they inevitably will, what are we supposed to do when hardships come, when trials come in our spiritual journey? What are we supposed to do? We pray, we have patience, we persevere, we work through it. Did Toby ultimately get to his destination? Yes. He overcame all the difficulties and hardships. And there are going to be trials and difficulties in our life. Our goal is to overcome them. Would you say that that's the spiritual lesson you would take out of your story? No. What, what so, lesson would you come out of your so story? So when I look at this, this story, the, the big spiritual lesson um, really has to do with temptation. What... what what ultimately led to the van burning down and this decision to go against um, my friend's girlfriend's dad's um, wishes was temptation, right? What is temptation? It's our own desire. It's our own want. Hey, I'm going to do this. I want to do this. I don't, care what, I don't care what you think or you think. I don't care what anybody thinks. I want this. I'm going to get it, right? So let's open up to James because James specifically talks about this, about, about temptation. And, and what is what is temptation, right? There's times where, um, you know, the difference is this. How many of you have ever been tempted and been enticed and gone into that and then said, and you're in this difficult time and God says, or you're, you're blaming God. God, why did you put me here? Have you ever blamed God for something you walked into? This is not the case, right? This was not God's doing, right? It wasn't God's will that I get in this van. It wasn't God, you know, it was my own sinful nature that that put me in this place. 
So if we go to uh, James 1 and verse 13. And it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Now I want you to notice um, here in verse 14, it says, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And that's exactly what happened in this situation, right? We were lured into that. It was our own desire. There's no question about that. Um, and what does it bring forth? We can go... Um, do we have the slide where it... Uh, the one where it talks about sin and disobedience? So we have up here under the spiritual lesson, right? This idea of sin and, and giving into this temptation. It's disobedience and selfishness. And you can see that in this situation. Um, because it affected those around us negatively. We were in disobedience to our parents, which then, if you think about it, is in, in disobedience to God because of what he commands about honoring our, our, our parents. So then we look at it. What do we do? What do we do when we get into temptation? What do we do? If it brings death, how do we... What's the answer to that? What's the answer when we run into temptation? We turn to God. Let's go to um, 1 Corinthians. And, and he gives us an answer out of this, right? Let me find it here. And it's chapter 10, um, verse um, 13 again. It says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. What's our way of escape? Could have said no, right? Because if you go a little bit down, it talks a little about fleeing, right? We flee from that. What do, we, what do we flee to? What do we escape to? Where do we go? Right? Jesus is the way out, right? He's the one that's going to rescue us out of out of this. Um, and you see it, even Jesus was not exempt from temptation, right? In, in Luke and in, in when he's out in the wilderness, who is tempting him? I think this is just as important as understanding when we walk into temptation or we're enticed, that there's something that is doing that. We have an enemy, an adversary, right? And what was he offering Jesus in the wilderness? He's offering those same things, right? I'll give you all these different... I'll give you the world, right? I'll give you... Why don't you make for yourself food? They're all self-serving things at that point, right? And that's where our temptation... That's where we get enticed is when it's self-serving. And, and like I had up there, it said sin is disobedience, it's carelessness, and it leads to death. What's the answer? On the other side of that slide, we put salvation, obedience, selflessness. And in those two, we can see in this situation, right, one is self-serving and it affects those negatively, right? When we serve ourselves, when ultimately we let the enemy draw us away and pull us away because what he wants is he wants us to not have our relationship with Jesus. And so he's working very hard to do that. But the answer is Christ, right? He rescues us out of our temptation. If we flee to him, right, and we walk in the things of him, which brings us life and a relationship with God. And so that's kind of where this, this temptation goes from here, from sin and death to life. Yeah, and we, when we were talking about the, the difference between these two stories, I think it's important for us to understand this, because I think we get confused. I don't know about you, I certainly get confused sometimes between the trials of life, the difficulties of life, that were kind of illustrated last week in Toby's story. There's an obstacle standing in the way. There's something between me and what I want. Sometimes life is just hard, isn't it? Sometimes I, I've just got to endure it. And God, I, I think you said this this week, God walks with us through our trials. He walks with us through the difficult times. He even walks with us right up until the moment that we're being tempted. But what, what we often get confused with is what happens when I make, as, as Jeremy said, a decision to sin. Right? Jesus, Jesus was tempted, yes? I'm giving you the answer. Was Jesus tempted? Yes. <laughs> 
What's the difference between Jesus and us when he was tempted and often when we're tempted? Yeah, he didn't fall. He didn't make the decision to get in the van and drive to El Paso, Texas. <laughs> Jesus would have said, that's the wrong thing to do. I need to go home. In fact, when Jesus' mom told him to do something he didn't think he should do, Jesus did it out of obedience. He said, I'm going to do what my mom told me to do. I'm going to honor my mother. We get trials and temptations messed up all the time. Or the result of temptations, when we fall to temptation. When we're living in sin, are there, are there difficulties that come about as a result of our sin? Yeah, the van burns to the ground. Yeah. And very often we stand there watching the van burn and say, God, how could you let the van burn? <laughs> and God yeah. says, I tried to give you five ways out of this, and you didn't take any of them, so now you're going to face the consequences. God walks with us. This is so important. God walks with us through our trials. He rescues us from our sin. Mm -hmm. He walks with us through the trial, and he rescues us from our sin. Who was the Christ figure in Jeremy's story? Not literally Jesus, but, but. <laughs> taking that form. Who was that in his story? Who rescued them? Our parents. Yeah, his parents. Yeah. Their parents said, okay, now we would have left him with the consequences. But his parents said, we're going to rescue you. We're going to save you. Front, and see if this sounds familiar in your own spiritual journey. Uh, we're going to save you from your own stupidity. We're going to save you from your poor choices. We're going to rescue you and bring you back to safety. Does that sound familiar? And isn't that important? The question is, how do we know when it's a trial, and how do we know when it's a result of our own sin? It's almost a hypothetical question, isn't it? How do you know? Right. There was a choice at some point. The key is, it was a whim. You didn't put any thought into it. Right. Right. And you see, that's the thing. That's how we are in life. Life moves really fast. You don't start to go, geez, what would Jesus, what would you do parents? Yeah, for those of you getting here, he's saying there's a choice that we make and there's planning. They did that on a whim instead of planning things out. So the real question is, what do we do with this? If we are, so you learned a lesson. You knew, figured out that your bad decisions, your sins were going to find you out. It impacted other people. Is this a case where we can only figure it out on the back end? Or is there a way to not get into that situation to begin with? I think the big thing is, um, like I said, I was 17 at the time, right? I'll give you the short, I, 9, 10 years old, I gave my life to Christ. Then I spent a good time at that place, and then I started to pull, pull away, right? I, I started to carelessly disobey. I started to, to walk in this direction. We have got to stay connected, and we've got to stay in the Word, right? How do we know what obedience is? How do we know what Christ is asking for us. We've got to spend time in the Word. We've got to ask Him, what is it that, that you're expecting of me that when I say I have a relationship with you, that this is what it looks like? We can see the result of the van burning down clearly of walking your own way, right? And it's, it's funny. Um, and in that case, really, we lost the van. It's funny and some 20 cash. years later. Yeah, we lost the van and, and, and the cash um, in, this, in this case. But the reality is, is that there's much more to lose when we choose to be disobedient and when we choose to walk our own path away, right? You know what you're talking about? We didn't, we didn't talk about this, but while, as you're talking about that, I'm thinking in that moment when they're sitting in the van, right, that's the decisive moment for them, right? That's the moment where they're going to choose right or wrong. How could they have known the right or wrong? And I think there's two ways. How could they have known the right or wrong decision to make in that moment? Consult somebody. Consult somebody right? So who should they have consulted in that moment? <laughs> right. So what's the spiritual parallel for us? We're not sure which way to go. What's the spiritual parallel? Prayer. Yeah. Who do you ask? You ask God. God right? Now, at the beginning of the trip, if mom and dad had already laid down the law, Look, if you get sent home, you come straight home. And I'm sure mom and dad didn't ever think, 
El Paso was in the picture. They didn't think they're going to come home, get in a van, and drive for 10 hours. But if they had said that, they'd already know the answer, wouldn't they? Should we now deep down you knew the right answer? Right? Oh, we knew the yeah. right answer. Deep yeah. down yeah. we yeah, know there's no question. Scripture already tells us the right or wrong. But when we get into a spot where we're not sure, what do we do? What should we do? We ask. God, is this the right thing or now very often why do we not ask? We don't want to know the answer. Know. Right? We we know that it's the ask for forgiveness, not permission. And we think, well, that's fine, except we very often have to deal with the consequences of not asking to begin with. We have to watch the ground burn down. And it's much better not to get in that situation. Than, and here's the example that I came up with, and we're going to kind of leave you with this, and we'll let you give the last word. Again, how do we know the difference? It's kind of like the difference between swimming and drowning, trials versus sin. Right? If, if you see someone's drowning, what's going on? They can't swim, and they put themselves in a situation where they needed to swim, but they can't. And how, do, how does the person get out of drowning? They get dragged by the hair. By the hair. Yeah. Someone has to rescue them. Have you ever watched someone teach someone to swim? Not someone already knows how to swim. Have you ever watched someone learn to swim? It looks very similar to drowning, doesn't it? They're flailing around, they're freaking out. Have you ever watched the, the person kind of hold their hands underneath? And, and they're telling them, you're okay, you're not going to drown. You, I got you. You ever heard that? I got you. You're, dads, you ever said that? I got you. How about your kids standing at the top of the stairs? Jump, I got you. I'll catch you, right? right? God's saying, look, you feel like you're drowning. That's what trials and, feel like. But God's saying, no, no, I got you. I'm holding on to you. Now, if you swim out too far, I'm going to have to come rescue you. You make a bad decision and put yourself in a place you shouldn't be. The good news for us is God will rescue us. Does that mean we don't have any consequences? Nope. The van still burned down. He was still grounded for four months. He probably never got to see that girl again. It wasn't me. It wasn't yeah, my girl. I know. <laughs> I'm using he in a global it was, sense. It of was he. my friend over here. Yeah. All right. Any last thing that you, so, you want to share? A couple of things. And I want you to just remember this, right? One, one way leads to death. One way leads to life, right? So remember those two things. Obedience leads to life in Christ. Apart from that is sin and death. So what I want you to do, and I thought about this, is we've talked about temptations and we've talked about trials, right? And most of the time we get into both and we blame God for why we're there. And so I don't know where you're at. Maybe, you're, maybe you've disobediently walked into sin. Or maybe you've just carelessly really kind of neglected your relationship with Christ and carelessly walked into it. And maybe you're angry at God and you're blaming God for the consequences that are happening or, you know, why am I here? Regardless of what that is, right? Addiction pornography, adult, whatever it is, adultery, and you're blaming God. Why, did, why am I here? Why did you put me here? For those of you who are there, what I want you to do is really look in the mirror and say, is, did I walk here? Did I get here myself? And I want you to remember when Jesus rescued you the first time, when you realized the life that he was going to bring to you when you first heard about him. And let him rescue you again, right? Turn back into him. Turn back into your relationship with him. Maybe you're going through a trial. Maybe there's something you don't understand and it's difficult and you're still angry at God and you're going, God, why am I here? I would ask that you'd spend that time instead of saying, why did you put me here? Maybe ask what he's walking you through. Say, what are you trying to show me through this? Because a lot of times he's trying to show you who he is and make you more like him when you're walking through those trials. And when you realize that, that that's a part of him making you more like Christ. He, he's creating you for eternity. Ask him, what are you showing me in this, in this trial? Look in the mirror and say, where am I at? Am I over here or am I over here? And then maybe there's the rest of you, right? The rest of you who, I don't know who's in this room, but maybe there's the rest of you who are like, I, I've probably walked into both and I don't know. And maybe, maybe through this, the Lord is saying, hey, I can show you something different. 
Start to seek out that. Listen to what the Lord is calling you to and start to turn into Scripture and, and find out who He is to become more like Him so you have an answer in your trial, in your temptation. So that, that's, that's what I'm thinking. Look in the mirror. Look at where you're at because I've been in both. I've been in both sides. And I can... If you've been in both, stand up. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for Jeremy sharing his story. And for the truth that we are very often in seasons of trial. And very often we find ourselves in a lot of trouble. Because we have fallen to temptation. And as, as the scripture says, we've, we've been dragged away. We've been lured away by our own sinful desires. We've made a decision that we're paying the consequences for. And as Jeremy said, I know it's true. I've lived it out. I've blamed you for both. God, how did I get here? How could you let this happen? And the truth is, you didn't let anything happen except let me make a choice. But the truth is, whether, when we're in trials, you're walking with us. You've got us. And when we do fall, you're there to rescue us. You're there to pick us up. Let us learn a lesson, deal with the consequences, and move forward. And I thank you for that truth. Father, we are never, ever, ever without hope. You are always there with us. When life is at its hardest, you're there walking with us. When we make the worst decisions of our life, you are there to rescue us and help us to deal with those consequences. And as Jeremy said, Father, as we look in the mirror today, this week, this month, over the course of this year, when difficulty comes, let us decide, figure out, was this my own doing or was this the result of just life and then act accordingly act in faith knowing that you're going to walk through it or repent of it and ask you to save us to help us to rescue us from the situation we've put ourselves in there is always hope you are always there you are always rescuing us you are always walking through with us thank you for that father and as we walk through these doors let us take that truth deep inside of us so that when the van is burning down, we know we can still make that phone call and you're going to be there with us. And all God's people said, amen. Go pay attention to your warning lights. God bless you. Have a great afternoon.